This is the first time that these four men have ever come forward together as a group to tell you first person, heart to heart, man to man, the incredible high strangeness that happens at the Skinwalker Ranch. We're going to uh, have the panel led by Thomas Winterton. I'm going to bring him out and he is going to introduce the remainder of the panel because Thomas Winterton is the superintendent of the Skinwalker Ranch. Please welcome Thomas Winterton. And uh, I'd like to bring up Jim Morse, who is the manager at Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, Jim is a uh, real estate developer by profession and uh, is, was closely associated with uh, the new ownership that took over. And so if Jim will come up, Jim is a... Uh, Thanks, Tom. Nice to see everybody. Jim will tell you, he loves to shake hands and kiss babies, and that's what he is really good at as the PR. And so uh, you, wherever there's a crowd of people, you can always find Jim. I, I won't be running for office. I'll be like trick, <laughs> be like trick or treat. So. Uh, the next person is our head of security, uh, Bryant Arnold. has a big task of securing the ranch, and uh, he's going to tell you a lot more about that tonight. Jim, go ahead. Right here? Yep. Yeah. So we'll bring on Bryant Arnold. Dragon. And Bryant, Jim, and I, along with the head scientist, Eric Bard, who's not here tonight, uh, make up the management of the ranch. And so we, uh, while I'm the superintendent, we all have equal roles in, in overseeing the, the happenings there at Skinwalker Ranch. And then uh, outside our team, we have friends of the ranch. And uh, one of those individuals, the person I'm gonna bring up right now, Ryan Skinner, uh, who has been associated with this ranch much longer than the three of us. Uh, he, he predates our time at the ranch. And uh, Ryan uh, had some difficult, he, his uh, home had a house fire last night. And uh, if it had been me, I'd been on the plane back home. But Ryan really wanted to be here to be able to share with you guys uh, some of his experiences and his knowledge of the ranch. And so we're grateful that he felt he wanted to be here so much that uh, he's sticking it out and he's, he's here with us tonight. We want to bring up Ryan Skinner. So uh, I know that as I've visited among you guys uh, over the last couple of days, there's many of you that have never heard of Skinwalker Ranch. And the Skinwalker Ranch is a 512-acre ranch that sits in northeastern Utah in the Uinta Basin. And it's one of the most studied paranormal hotspots in the world. And uh, so tonight, the four of us want to, to uh, go into a little bit of the history of Skinwalker. So those of you that have never heard of it can understand why that's the case. And then uh, we're going we're gonna to share some of our experiences since we've taken over. And, uh, and share with you a clip. We, we have a special clip that we're going to share with you tonight, a sneak peek of a TV series that's going to be airing on the History Channel starting in March. And so we have a sneak peek of that we'll share with you as well. Um, so starting with that, let's get into it. Um, starting with Jim, I'm going to ask you guys to share how you became associated with Skinwalker Ranch. and. Uh, and what your position is. Thanks, Tom. Uh, about four or five years ago, I was asked by a very prominent businessman uh, in the uh, Salt Lake City area um, for me to ask me what I was going to be doing at 7 a.m. the following day. And of course, I've had such a confidant relationship with this gentleman. I said, about anything you want me to be doing. So I went out to uh, airport and he flew me down to Skinwalker Ranch in his helicopter. And uh, when we landed, we got clearance from the security guards. Uh, we walked the property and being a real estate developer, he asked me um, if I felt anything. Um, I've always had a, a, a mutual respect for the land. Um, 
Uh, I'm a commercial real estate developer, but uh, you know, I always approach property um, hoping that I'll get some type of feedback or vibration or frequency from the ground, and, and you approach it with a level of respect. And uh, this particular piece of property, um, from the second that I got on the property, and I'm not trying to be corny here, but I, I begin the day and end the day with prayer, this particular piece of property, uh, being out there in the Uinta Basin, um, there's, there's what they call the easement of the skinwalker, the lore of the skinwalker. I don't know how many of you understand what a skinwalker is, and I'm not trying to get into the superstitious, you know, Ouija board, woo-woo side, but I'm very respectful of, of my native brothers and sisters. And in this particular piece of ground, the easement of the skinwalker is the lore of this shapeshifter, where the Navajo and the Ute got into a fight in the mid-1800s, and the Navajos cursed this particular piece of property. It's a really interesting piece of property, very remote, but there's a pretty substantial easement that you have to go through on the reservation to get to this piece of property. So as I got on the property, I felt as if somebody was looking or observing me right from the get-go. And instead of uh, feeling like I've got to put a chip on my shoulder and I'm, I'm the toughest guy in the room, I just pulled away and just kind of, once again, approached and embraced this piece of property with a level of respect. And the last four or five years, um, I can tell you with my hand on the Bible, I can validate some of the things that I have witnessed, sensed, and seen and had on the ranch um, will be um, seen on this History Channel the end of March. But um, there's a lot of things that I just don't understand. Um, you know, I'd like to think that I'm a spiritual person, even though you may not see me in the front pew um, at church. There's just We're a working side. on that. We're going to get you back there. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell there's a, there's a family here between us. We, we've all been in the trench together. We, we're very concerned about each other's well-being and some of the things that we've not only witnessed but we've seen happen to some of us here uh, where there's been hospitalization. I mean, this is a no-nonsense, no not for the faint of heart. Thank you. Brian? So you want me to talk about how... I, I forgot. I didn't properly introduce. Brian is also known as Dragon. So if you're, if you're perusing the Internet and you come across this really... Uh, I don't know what I'm allowed to say up here. Badass uh, security guard that's referenced to Dragon. This is Dragon, the, the famous Dragon. So, uh, Brian or Dragon, tell us how you came associated with Ranch and uh, kind of your, Do you your role there. How you got that nickname? Some dipshit gave me that nickname. <laughs> oh, sorry, Ryan. You gave me that nickname. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they thought you were a skinwalker, I think. Is. Right. So my association with Skinwalker Ranch, um, not too dissimilar um, from Jim's. I, I actually have been friends with the current owner of the property who bought it from Robert Bigelow back in 2016. Um, we've been close friends for over 26, 27 years. Um, and he approached me in kind of the same way and, and told me what his idea was and my answer to him was, what? I had never really known about Skinwalker Ranch, and I said, why in the hell do you want that? Um, because I didn't know anything about it. And he just said, you know, it's there's all these stories and everything, but my goal is I want to find out if it's legit or if they're just stories, and I need somebody that I can trust. I need people that I can trust that I know are going to have my well-being in mind as well as the properties and he said I know I can trust you you've got a unique set of skills that I need so will you go you know and, and check the place out so I did um, and you know it was 512 acres in the Uinta Basin you know it didn't look much different than the surrounding area it didn't look special it was nice it was cool it was a you know a fun place to go but you know it didn't seem terribly special um, or different to me. Um, and I think part of what has 
made it unique for me is I kind of approached it with that mindset, more of an agnostic mindset. Not that I didn't believe that there were things happening there, but also uh, that, you know, there were possibly not things happening there. There was just stories. And so I kind of had an open mind and, you know, for a long time, I didn't believe in anything. And, you know, as time has gone on, things have changed a little bit. But, I mean, I guess the real question was, uh, you know, how I became associated with it? Totally by happenstance, by relationship. And, you know, to this day, it's probably been one of the, you know, the greatest things that's ever happened to me is my association with that property and, and these guys here. And, you know, I'm excited, honestly, for people that have the same mindset or, you know, questioning or programming of what the norm is. Um, you know, I'm really excited for the opportunity that everybody is going to have to kind of get behind the gates a little bit in the upcoming show uh, to see a little bit more of what actually goes on and maybe their view on reality is going to change a little bit as well. Thank you. So uh, the three of us are new to the new ownership, which like uh, Brian alluded to, uh, changed hands in 2016. And uh, if somebody else, a lot of times people will say, oh, you're the Skinwalker expert. Eh, I'm not an expert. I, can, I, I know really well what's taken place since 2016. But as far as the history of the ranch, uh, I grew up in the Una Basin. Uh, about, I live about 15 miles away from it. And we are about, one, we're the, the next exit is the middle of nowhere. So we're right before the middle of nowhere if you try to go out and find the ranch. And so I, I, it's famous out where we're from. I knew about it, but uh, as I had heard the, the big stories. But knowing the history and the chronology and the, the events that have taken place, I, I haven't. And to be honest, I, I hadn't ever watched any of the movies or read any of the books. Um, and so with that, uh, brings us to Ryan because Ryan is an individual that has really dived in. He's done a lot of research, interviewed a lot of people, and uh, he predates when the three of us came on. Um, and, and he's been a valuable uh, friend of the ranch that has helped us kind of bridge the two uh, eras the Bigelow era and then the Adamantium era. And so, Ryan, uh, if you'd share with them how you became associated with the ranch and uh, how, how you got tangled up in it. Thanks, Tom. I guess it all started around 2006. And I consider myself more of a fanatic of the ranch and a, I guess, devotee to whatever is going on out there as it has beyond impressed me as to the validity of this hidden reality that exists beyond us that we're not aware of. And uh, it left such a lasting impression upon me that it created this obsession that is still fueled to this day that draws me to the ranch. Um, what, what initially brought me there had absolutely nothing to do with uh, skinwalkers or ranches in Utah. I was going through uh, Colorado and to Utah to actually get married in Nevada. And as I just crossed the border, I pulled off into a rest area. And it's, I'm from Wisconsin originally. Everything's kind of plains and valleys and corn and cows. And just for me to see the, I guess, the beauty of the endless canyons and the moonlit night in the sky, uh, I pulled over on the side and just really took in the beauty and depth of Utah. And I shouted out to the canyon, which is just odd to me in retrospect. You know, I am here, <laughs> which, uh, I, again, I, to this day, I don't know why. I announced my presence. And it's almost as if something heard me and responded to me, because we got back into the car, continued on our trip towards uh, Vegas, and suddenly I was teaching my wife at the time, how to, or wife-to-be, how to drive. And she kept complaining that there's, there's this ball of light chasing us. There's something behind the car. And her having never driven before, I'm looking in the rearview mirrors. I, I'm, I don't know. I'm trying to find out what mirage she's looking at. And finally, I have her pull over the car. We get out of the car. And again, I'm still not convinced. I, I'm trying to think of any traditional explanation I can come up with. I look behind the car, and there is what appears to be a glowing sparkler 
or a flare that is levitating 20 feet behind the car, four feet up in the air, and I'm stunned. And when I say stunned, I don't know if <laughs> I'm physically immobilized, but I, w when you actually are face to face with the unknown and you have no frame, rate, uh, frame of reference to what you're witnessing and what you're experiencing, you, the mind just seems to lock up and I was frozen. At that point, I hear her scream. She, uh, it breaks that state of confusion and fear and I jump into the car. She says there's three people coming towards the car, three shadow people and that just shatters the moment of that frozen time for me. And I get in the car and take off. Uh, there's a lot more to that story that happened. Uh, kind of funny part, I want to kind of get through it quickly. We do end up pulling over on the side of the road and uh, she's, she's Russian and there's kind of a cavalier and strong <laughs> personality to some of these Russian women that I noticed. And she said, she said, right, you know, and I'm just, I'm an absolute wreck. You know, what was that? Oh my God, what did we just see? <laughs> and she goes, what are you doing? You know, you've always shown an interest in this stuff. You need to stop what you're doing, and this is what you've been looking for your whole life. You, you need to turn the car around and go back there. And I'll tell you, in my mind at that time, that was the very last thing that I wanted to do. I just wanted to go to, <laughs> to Vegas, get married, and come back to Wisconsin. And, I mean, just begrudgingly, I'm like, oh, the logic is, she's right. She's absolutely right. This is what I've been subconsciously looking for for all these years, and I will never know, and that's one opportunity I have. We turned the car around, came back to the location. The lights did come back up to the car. Um, I'm paraphrasing a very long story, and it, I've never had this experience at the ranch, but it transformed into three transparent gray aliens that were staring directly at us. Um, I remember rolling the window down in a state of, again, a state of shock, having never seen this before, having no idea what I'm looking at, what potential harm it could cause to me. And I, I, I don't mean you any harm, I'm trying to communicate with it. it, there's no response. And I remember as I'm saying this silly gibberish, <laughs> meaningless gibberish to whatever it is, whatever unknown presence from wherever it traveled from, as I'm doing this diatribe, it, one of the ones in the middle, and they're frozen like statues, it turns its head kind of like a dog would if you were to explain a command to a dog. And again, <laughs> that American fear versus her Russian pride kicked in and I jumped in, the, I hit that uh, gas pedal as hard as I could and I didn't look back this time, no matter what she was saying. Now the point of the story is, this left such a deep impact on me. I reached out to MUFON, I reached out to Utah UFO investigators, every possible uh, forum out there I could and didn't receive a reply. And I knew this was real. It left a deep scarring impression on me. And I wanted answers. Why, why this location? And once I got back home, I got on the internet, and I searched, and I found Skinwalker Ranch in the book by George Knapp's Hunt for the Skinwalker was a mere 20 to 30 miles as a crow flies to the north. And I guess... The rest is history. I had to find out everything I could about this place. And, and it was much more than, things much more dramatic have happened there than what happened on the side of the road that day. And that brings us to, uh, I'd like to dive into some of the history of the ranch for those that uh, have not heard of Skinwalker Ranch. Some of the, the events that have been reported there. And uh, first I want to take, Jim, if you'll take two or three minutes and just dive in a little more about what the, the history of the ranch and how it got its name and, and uh, a little bit about the, the Skinwalker and, and if you feel comfortable, maybe your experience with the Skinwalker. Be happy to, thank you. Um, as I said before, the, the lore of the Skinwalker shapeshifter, uh, which is the transformation of a man or a woman to uh, a, a wolf. Um, but this particular piece of property, it's been documented that there was, it was the curse of the Navajo that cursed this particular piece of property, which if you understand an easement, basically like a, a driveway back to this remote piece of property, this was the, the easement of the skinwalker, where the skinwalker kind of basically came and it went. And um, it, it's a really, really hard piece of property to find. If you put it on the GPS, I doubt you'd find it. But uh, you start looking at the history of this back there, Things that have happened personally to me, and I, you know, again, I don't, I don't embrace, you know, some of the things that, that Ryan 
talks and visits with us about in regards to seeing an alien. I have not seen an alien. What I have seen is, is this frequency, this vibration, where we have a, a ranch car. It's a, it's a, a Denali. And um, good or bad, this frequency out there, especially certain parts of the ranch, uh, in this particular case, what we call Homestead 2, uh, we were ready to go ahead and call it a day, get off the ranch, and um, all my lights in the Denali just got basically shorted out. Um, um, things like that that happen that you just question, you know, what would bring this on? Um, we have, and, and I, my, my previous life, I was a military police officer, uh, telling a Vietnam low lottery number those days. And uh, so I worked with a lot of canines and uh, had, uh, being a security police officer, had people that I worked with every night, day swing, swings and, and, and mids. And what we'd usually do is we would, um, I'd always want to visit with the military police officers coming on shift, make sure the state of mind, morale was good, there wasn't any drinking. This particular night, it was a swing shift. And um, what, was, what was pointed out to me was two red eyes. And, and we do have wild animals. You're out there, like I say, in a very remote area. We have mountain lions, we have bear. Um, there's just an eclectic uh, bunch of animals out there. And this night here, it was probably from here to that wall over there where there was two distinct red eyes just peering um, at us. Uh, the dogs were frozen, um, and at that point, I, it was not something that I wanted to approach. And so that's what I've, I've witnessed out there is, is frequency, high frequency, where lights have been blown out in a car, and then something that just looked at us, looked away, looked back, and it was a feeling like, I'm not going to approach you, please don't approach me. And um, that, that's been my experience as Tom out there. Thank so, you. You bet. Brian, I'm going I'm to pivot just a little bit with you. Um, security has played an important part of the ranch for the last couple of decades. Uh, share with us what your job entails, why we even have security, and, and touch on the Bigelow era and, the, and what security measures were taken then. Okay. So, securing 512 acres in the middle of nowhere from people like Brian Skinner, not an easy job. Um, when I first came on um, as head of security, before, you know, we actually became associated with Ryan, it was kind of Ryan Skinner's public enemy number one. Watch out for him. If he's in town, he's going to try and sneak on the ranch and do all this different kind of stuff because, uh, and he did. <laughs> and because previously, um, previous ownership, Robert Bigelow, he didn't want, he wanted to investigate the place and do whatever it was that he was doing and keep it all to himself. I mean, 20 years of Robert Bigelow owning Skinwalker Ranch, there is next to no information that's come out of it unless it was through George Knapp, who is his buddy, who he lets do all of his press releases and things like that. So it was very, you know, scrubbed and made sure that we'll give you a little, you know, idea here type of a situation. Um, and so we inherited really nothing. Um, but with that, they were very aggressive with um, their security efforts. They would get former, you know, military people and things like that out there that were kind of loose cannons and were just out there to do whatever they could to make sure that nobody set foot on the property. And it was more of you know, an intimidation factor. They bullied around um, a lot of the local government and people like that because it was a money thing. It was, you know, I've got more money than you do. This is what's going to happen. So with that, um, their idea of security was just to be very aggressive. Um, so um, when we took over, or when current ownership took, I say we because we are a ranch family. It, honestly, yeah. you'll refer... All of us will probably refer to when we this, that's because the owner of the ranch has really basically said, we're a family here. This is our place. This, we have, you know, we have stead over this and, you know, we're all in this sort of thing together. So forgive me. I don't own it. 
you know. So you can't ask me if you can have permission to get on because I'm going to say no. Um, but honestly, uh, when we took over, we didn't realize the daunting task that we had ahead of us. Um, for our, you know, if there's a lot of intrigue there. People like Ryan who are you know searching for truth, or people that have less good intent want to come and it's almost like there's a sense of well because I'm interested in this that gives me the right to be there you know I'm I mean I'm a fan of the Oakland Raiders I can't go walking into their locker room and say hey you know I'm I like you guys so I get to be here right and, and it's unfortunate but that's kind of within this realm of things kind of the attitude that you know is taken you know I'm an enthusiast I want to seek out the truth so that gives me the right to go well the current owner has Probably has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in scientific equipment. It is a 100%, 24-7, observed and looked at scientific investigation going on there. Anytime an individual comes on there, our cameras are going to pick things up, our other equipment, our sensors of any kind are going to pick that up, and then we have to take hours and hours and hours of time to go back and say was this a phenomenon type of an event or was this human intervention and it's just between the amount of money that's there and the amount of time and effort it takes it really sets things back and you know honestly we just want to know what's going on there we want to know why things are happening and then as Jim touched on it, it is Skinwalker Ranch is a dangerous place the terrain itself, I've seen Ryan come back after he was finally invited to be on the property, clothes and ribbons. And I'm like, what have you been doing? And, you know, he took a fall and, and it's dangerous. We have mountain lions with paws the size of my hand that I've seen prints of. I mean, we have all of the known, normal, natural things, and then we have the unknown. You know, we don't know what's going on. Individuals have flat out been hurt, almost killed on that property from things that there's no medical explanation for. So, because of the day and age that we live in, whenever anyone trespasses on that property, even if they're not supposed to be there and it's posted and they get hurt on that property, where do you think the liability falls? Falls upon the ownership of the ranch. And so, it's just, it's, it's kind of a tough effort to try and keep people with their enthusiasm because we understand that, but also respectful enough to know that there's a scientific investigation going on. It's a dangerous place, and if something was to happen, it could end the ability to even share any of that information, and we'd back, be back to the dark age of the Bigelow era where, oh, it's a spooky place, and there's guys carrying guns around, and we don't know what goes on there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's vital that we have security. I'm grateful I have a really good security team and we have amazing equipment out there that helps with the job. But, but as you can imagine, 512 acres that's surrounded by tribal land and is in a rural area, it's really tough. And so, you know, we hope that we want to be respectful of people and their enthusiasm. That's part of why we're doing, you know, that's why that's part of why the owner even allowed a, net, a television network to come in and film is because we don't necessarily want to keep secrets, but we want to make sure that we get to the bottom of the truth and that it's real and that it's genuine. And so, you know, we don't want people getting hurt either. At the end of the day, my number one reason for being there is to watch out for the people that live there and the people that work there and to protect individuals coming onto the property from getting hurt. Because I would hate that. I don't want somebody to get hurt. We don't wish ill will. I'm not looking to, to cause fights or cause trouble, but there's times when, you know, people don't take a hint and you have to get a little bit, you know, aggressive with them. And thanks to the uh, online world, apparently that's how I got the nickname Dragon is. I was. Well, I have a resting bitch face, okay? So when I'm so when I'm focused or something, I just, you know, I kind of have that scowl and it can be a little intimidating, but at the end of the day, you know, it's really there to protect the land, what's going on in the people that live there. We'll show them some pictures in a few minutes. Oh, good. Prove that out. 
Uh, so the ranch, there, there's been reportings of strange happenings dating clear back into the 1800s. Early, early settlers reported hearing strange sounds coming from the ground. Um, there was sightings, UFO sightings as well, clear, clear back uh, early 1900s. And uh, the ranch was owned by a family called the Myers, and, uh, and then they sold it to a family called the Shermans. And almost immediately upon possession of this, and Ryan, I can't remember, what year did the Shermans take over possession of the ranch? Do you, do you remember? I keep thinking it's, is it 96 when Bigelow took over, or when they, uh, it was two years or four years before that? They weren't there long, but it was in the 90s. And I, I, I think. It was like 93, I think. Yeah, so you have the Shermans. And I'll tell you, my family, uh, the, the Shermans are good people. and. They're well known there in the basin. And here's a family that had a dream of having a cattle ranch. And so they purchased this 512 acre ranch uh, with the dream of, of pursuing their, uh, raising these prized cattle. Now for, you, uh, for some of you may be aware that with cattle, there's your regular beef cattle herds and your, your milk cows. And then there's genetically, uh, they're high value beef or uh, they're all beef, I guess, in <laughs> one form or another, but high value uh, cows that, that are worth a lot of money and they're bred specifically for their genetics, their good genetics. And these cows can start getting up $20,000 a cow. I've seen them $100,000 a cow. These are very expensive animals, very prized because of their superior genetics. And that's what the Shermans wanted to get into was these high, uh, high value cows. And so, almost immediately taking possession of the ranch, they start experiencing some very, very strange things and, and being harassed. And so Ryan, what I'd like you to do for the next three or four minutes is share some of the things that the Shermans experienced after buying the ranch. Some of the more dramatic stories. Hit the, yeah, hit the big dramatic ones. Kind of made a list, but uh, First of all, kind of with a raise of hands, how many people have read Hunt for the Skinwalker by George Knapp? So um, I mean, it's gonna be kind of a regurgitation of some of that material, but it sounds like a lot of you, or looks like a lot of you, uh, this is gonna be some new content for. So I wanna hit on the big ones. I think, uh, well, one of the biggest peculiarities of the Shermans, when they first moved onto the property, they were shocked to find that there was large chains all over the property for. I don't know, it was a big part of the book that the large chain supposedly housed these monster dogs that were needed to protect the property from some sort of unseen predator. But I, th I found it even more interesting was inside the house itself, they had locks. Not, it's not interesting that they had locks, but they actually had locks on all the drawers uh, throughout, the, throughout their cabinets. And the reason for that was, was that these balls of light would infiltrate into the house and would open up random, like poltergeist kind of activity, would open up drawers and shut drawers and it was becoming so frequent and horrific to the owners that they bolted shut. And I believe you found evidence of that, yeah. some of the bolt holes. And that was one of the first things when I, the first time I visited it's one thing the to ranch, read the story, I wanted another, to see these yeah. locks, but yeah, you're, you're right. So that's, that was always impressive to me. Uh, I, shortly after moving on the property, I believe uh, Gwen Sherman had returned home to the ranch and she described this dire wolf-like creature, this wolf almost the size, I guess it's the height of the wolf was as large as the top of her car, was stalking around the property. And uh, that alone kind of set the tone for future things that would come. Uh, moving forward, I don't know if it's the same wolf or a different one, but this is a story of the bulletproof wolf, or as I like to call it, the zombie wolf. They returned to the, uh, well, I guess uh, Gwen and Terry were at the property just uh, tending to the cattle, and they noticed this uh, wolf that walked right up to them. First of all, wolves are not native to the Utah region. I, I heard that they're being reintroduced now but at that time, they were completely eradicated from Utah. So Especially not car-sized wolves. Yeah, those yeah, are, I don't, they eradicated those sometimes. I think ago. those are <laughs> reserved for Game of Thrones or something ago. like that. Yeah. 
Well, as, as this wolf approached them, first of all, the first unique thing they found out about the wolf was its demeanor. It walked right up to Terry. I believe he even reached out and found it, he thought it was a domesticated wolf, which is strange in its own accord. Uh, and I, I guess the family kind of gathered around it. And this, this has been a common theme that I've, from interviewing others, there's been these strange dogs and wolves that have approached people, I mean, not just dogs, but these large canine creatures that appear friendly. And I've had my own close encounter that I talk about in the, in the TV show that I probably can't detail right now. But regardless, the wolf walks up to the pen. It sticks, one of the calf sticks its nose through the pen's uh, entrance, and the wolf takes a, latches its teeth onto the calf and starts to attempt to drag it out through the pen itself. Uh, at this point, this is now no longer some domesticated, friendly wolf. This is taking his livestock, his livelihood. And uh, Terry, I believe, I thought he took the butt of a gun or a bat or something and hit the wolf to uh, break its hold. That, that had seemed to have no effect whatsoever on the wolf. He then progresses to the next stage and pulls out his revolver and shoots the wolf almost point blank. The wolf barely flinches and continues struggling to pull this calf out you know, with a wary look to uh, Terry. Clearly the revolver's not enough firepower, so he goes inside and at this point the wolf begins to slowly walk away. Notice at this point there's no blood coming from the wolf, nothing. It's not limping, but it is beginning to retreat slowly. And I think he goes inside the house and comes back with a high, high caliber rifle and approaches the wolf, gets, uh, I believe from remembering, he's got a very good shot, he's a very well aimed, he's an avid hunter, and hits the wolf dead on into the flank. And a piece of flesh actually flies off of the wolf. The, the wolf again shrugs off the wound, which isn't a wound, and continues trotting off in a, in a very calm retreat from Terry. He follows the wolf at this point. Apparently bullets aren't working, bats aren't working, nothing's working to stop this wolf. He follows the trail and suddenly the wolf is gone, the footprints are gone, it's gone completely from the face of this earth. Again, Terry was also not only a hunter but an avid tracker. So he would know where this wolf had ended up and it had vanished at that point. He goes back, what I always found interesting was that he goes back to the, the hunk of flesh lying on the ground. And instead of a bloody piece of meat, he instead finds a rotten, smelly piece of dingy flesh. Which is how I came up with the, the zombie wolf is more appropriate than bulletproof. Uh, moving forward, another... Oh, I, one of the more exciting stories that I always enjoyed was some of the best scientists, or NID scientists, I think at that time, were on the ridge line looking down into the, the fields and they saw a, what looked like a, a, a glow in the field. And as this glow began to elongate, um, one of the scientists uh, who was looking at it through a night vision scope, I believe at the time, noticed that a tube emerged from that, from that glow. And out of that tube crawled, through this tube, <laughs> a large black humanoid figure. He didn't say a Bigfoot, this large black shadowy massive figure crawled out of the tube and ran off throughout the ranch. And that right there is kind of horrifying to even think of this thing scampering around out there and who knows where it was going or where it came from. Uh, Terry, uh, the most perhaps endearing and exciting story for me is Terry describes an event where he looks off into the western field and sees what he describes as a portal opening up in the sky, some I don't know, 30 feet up in the air or so in the distance. He, he looks through his rifle scope into that portal and he sees what looks like a completely different landscape and different lighting. It, it's now dark at night, pitch black, and he's seeing daylight, another landscape through that portal. You know, what's on the other side? Where is this thing? Why is it opening up in the ranch? And, and will others open up in the future? You know. And I can tell you that they do. I've just had so many experiences. There's disembodied voices that we've heard without people being there. Gentlemen having conversations above your head. You look up, there's no one there. The, the Shermans themselves have had these encounters, these balls of lights that zip all out throughout the property. 
and then dissipate into the air. And finally, the final story is the Shermans, what really motivated them to get the hell off of the ranch and not come back is one of these, these balls of light they noticed off in the field and their dogs went off chasing the balls of light and they were nipping and snarling and trying to, I don't know, catch and t take down one of these balls of light and suddenly the balls of light, almost, as, if, as if being lured, lured them off into one of the tree lines, a dense, thick tree line in the distance. The dogs run into this tree line, the balls of light are in there as well. Suddenly, Terry can no longer see the dogs. He hears a yelp, a howl and a scream from the dogs and no more. At, that's, at that point, being what he just witnessed, hearing the horrific sounds of his pets, he calls it a night. He's going to look in the morning to see what happened. He comes out the next morning and finds nothing but a bloody, greasy, buttery blob on the ground, three of them, hair and teeth, and what I can only assume are the remains of his dogs. And that was enough to get them to pack up and move out. It is a dangerous place. I can definitely attest to that. Well, and that and they lost, what, up to 30% of their herd? of their prized cattle, these genetic cows and everything like that. I mean, we're talking daylight cattle mutilations where they'd have a healthy cow or calf in the field and they'd go to the other end of the property in the middle of the day and within an hour they'd come back and there was a surgically dissected calf or cow with vital organs removed, no blood left behind on the ground, looked like it had been, you know, taken apart with surgical precision within a short amount of time during the middle of the day. And I mean, they bought this ranch to kind of live, I guess if you want to use the cliche, the American dream of raising prized cattle for their family. And it got to the point where whatever it was, was causing that to happen. So between that and scary things happening to their dogs and having to lock up your groceries in the cupboard so they don't end up back in the grocery sack on top of the table. I mean, there's quite a few really, you know, fantastic stories, if you will, um, associated with the property. I can, I can tell you the catalyst that I've never shared before and a story that's not written in any books, the real reason that Gwen and Terry decided to pack up and hit the roads for, for good. I've been in contact with uh, Gwen Sherman for many years. Uh, she shared, actually it was a friend of hers, a close friend who's vetted, who shared this final story with me. She said uh, one night the family was in bed and they awoke to seeing two large shadow figures, possibly similar to the things that emerged from the portal, staring at them standing directly over their bed. And at that point, with the dogs being melted, the people being in their own bedroom, the intrusion of their privacy, the loss of their cattle, for anybody, it would be a breaking point, and I can understand yeah, they, why they left. And, and that really, that's what makes Skinwalker Ranch unique uh, and, and maybe stand out a little bit from other places is that they're not just one type of anomaly that, that's been reported. You have the cattle mutilations. We, you have UFO aircraft that have been seen landing there in the field, um, the orbs chasing the cows, uh, equipment. Terry turning around to get something, coming back, and his, his farm equipment's gone to find it 75 feet up in a tree, uh, in a cottonwood tree, and uh, a, a couple days later, and really uh, just a wide range of anomalies and, and phenomena that, that take place. And so the Shermans, having experienced this, uh, some of this started to be reported in local newspapers, and, uh, and, you know, there was others in the local area that were, were experiencing, experiencing some of the same things with cattle mutilations and it caught the interest and the attention of Robert Bigelow, uh, a very wealthy businessman uh, down here in Las Vegas, actually. And uh, he came in and purchased the ranch and uh, started the, uh, I always get these things, NIDS, right? Uh, National Institute of Discovery Science. Correct and brought in a team of scientists and started to try figure out what's going on on this ranch. And uh, as part of that, in 2017, we know from, uh, I think the New York Times reported that there was actually, Robert Bigelow had received 22 or $23 million uh, in a program in 
uh, cooperation with the government to study UFOs and the events that were taking place at Skinwalker Ranch. And so we assume, uh, like Brian alluded to, when, when we took over the ranch in 2016, uh, Mr. Bigelow did not pass on any data with the ranch. And so we inherited it with uh, all these stories that are out there, but with no evidence to back them up. And that's really where our story began, is we, we came into this ranch with a clean slate as far as data, which I think was actually a blessing. Um, it, it allowed us to kind of wipe the, wipe the slate clean, and that started the, the adamantium uh, period of time. And uh, that's where I came in. I actually, uh, when Jim came out, the, I think it was the first time you came out to Roosevelt, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, after his trip with the owner, he, my wife and I own a couple of small motels there in the basin and uh, he was coming through town and I just happened to be there when he pulled in and our motels were very nice but they're small and, and I used to joke with people and they'd say I can't find it, where the road shed, or where the, the motel looks like uh, storage sheds on the side of the road here and uh, we're just a, a single story little motel and so Jim pulled in and he said, I don't know if I want to stay here or not. I said, I'll come see a room. And so he got out and, and came in and saw our rooms and saw they were nice. And he ended up staying with us and we struck up a conversation, Jim being Jim, and uh, found out that I was a general contractor and uh, said, you know, I, I managed this ranch out here and we're trying to get a feeling for what's, what we just purchased and asked me if I'd come out and do a property inspection. And so we went out and struck it up and uh, I assisted them in, in uh, repairing a few things there on the ranch, and they asked me to stay. Did it look like $22 million that had been invested in the ranch? You know, uh, $22. <laughs> there's more mysteries than the UFOs out at the ranch, like where they hid $22 million, right? Um, and so that brings us into the Adam Antimera, and I remember meeting the owner for the first time and, and hearing this individual talk about why there was an interest in purchasing the ranch. And really this interest of as answering the questions, where do we come from, why are we here, and where are we going? Are we alone in the universe? Is there, is there something else out there that we don't know? And he was willing to back this curiosity up with his finances and his resources and uh, because we didn't inherit any data, I remember the first instructions was we're going to enter into a period of observation. And so for the first, what was it, a year, 18 months, the instruction to the scientists, and we have our head scientist out there is one of the smartest individuals I've ever had the privilege of being around, a brilliant man uh, named Eric Bard. And we were given the instruction to observe. We have all these crazy stories, but is there any data to back these up? And so we went into a period of just laid low and just watched to see what the ranch would reveal to us. And uh, I'm going to share a couple photos with you here, um, give you an idea. So this is a, what we call the bait pen. Drives our scientists crazy. He says it's not a bait pen, it's an observation tower. So. But we, the bait pen just kind of stuck, but uh, Bigelow built these. Uh, Brian, you want to share, why don't you tell us a little bit about bait pens and, and what they were used for? Sure, so across the property there's three of these, and they're basically um, these observation type towers, a built up tower, and then there's a chain link fence with uh, razor wire on top of it, around it. And it was very peculiar seeing because it's basically tipped out as if trying to keep something from going out, I mean from outside, from getting in and usually if you have a pen for dogs or anything like that, you're trying to keep them going the other direction. So it's very strange. Um, and so the story that I've been told um, is that they would place guards or scientists in these quote observation towers and then they would put dogs or cattle or whatever as they like to call them biosensors um, but really it was more kind of like bait if you will to see if whatever the phenomenon was that was mutilating the other cattle 
they could capture what was happening by them going in there. And I, I found it ridiculous. I was like, we're dealing with an intelligence here that can, in the middle of the day, snap up a cattle, a, a cow, and going to mutilate it, put it back without you knowing it, or do all this other kind of stuff that has been alluded to before, but it's going to choose that cow in that pen to be the one that it's going to go after. I mean, why didn't they just get a really big box with a stick underneath it and pull it out from under when, you know, I mean, that's the way I looked at things, but, you know, I kind of gave grief to the previous people that worked there and they said, no, this was an observational thing, it was a biosensor so that when something was in the area, the animals would react and they would give them kind of a heads up to keep an open eye or, or watch more closely to see if they could pick up on what the phenomenon is. Because, you know, animals react to storms and other things, and, and we've witnessed some of that as well. So they were called bait pens. I'll give them the benefit on the doubt on that one because I've poked a lot of fun at their bait pens. Well, I was going to say, even, even I'm smart enough when I rob 7-Eleven to scout out where the security cameras are before right, they go, exactly. go in there. So, um, so this is, they're, they're all identical. There's three of them, like you said, spread across. Um, this is actually a picture through one of our, this is a night vision camera that we uh, put in after we acquired the property. You, this is just kind of a cool picture of the bait pen at midnight out there through the night vision um, camera. So we entered this observation period. Is there, ever, is there anything going on? And uh, this is one of the first things that we captured. And uh, now mind you, in the surveillance, we've seen tons of dust particles fly by the camera. Uh, lots of what our scientists call snow, uh, what does Eric call them? Snorbs. Snorbs, right? Snowflakes that streak across. You, sh you should see a snowflake go across a camera in infrared that can't keep up with the speed of the snowflake, you would swear you've seen the greatest UFO thing in the world. But that's the beauty of our scientist, is his very first thing, and it's a tough job as a scientist, especially someone tasked with trying to figure out things within this realm where everyone wants to feel like they've experienced something, is it's what I love about Eric. He is going to go through every possible channel to prove himself wrong he says the toughest thing as a scientist is to have to prove your theory wrong, but he's not going to put anything out there until he has vetted it through every possible resource before he's going to say, now this could be peculiar. He wants to figure out, and, it, and it's been disappointing. We've seen some cool stuff that turned out to be dust or snorbs. Snorbs, lots of snorbs, thousands of snorbs that we've gone through. Um, now, this picture right here, I, whether, what it is, we don't know. Uh, the important thing was, is this is the first thing that caught our attention. And this happened in literally less than a second. And uh, in this, what it did is it, it caught our attention. Um, and which made us start to dig into the footage even closer. And, and what that did is when you start going through the footage frame by frame, that's when we started to see maybe there's there's yeah, things this, going on. This particular one basically, I mean, so we're talking 500, what would you say, Tom, from the east gate to the west fence, the how many miles or whatever it is of that the, the ranch is from, from east to west? What would you say, a couple east miles? East gate to the, well, that's at least a mile. Okay, yeah. so you've got a mile. So this shows up near the west side of the property and becomes illuminated and then within the amount of time for it to what, like a second? No, it was it was like yeah, a, a split second. Like traveled, two fifteenths of a second. I can't remember the, the frame entire right length was. of the property and went out of sight. And the only way we were able to even capture this is with a frame by frame down to the millisecond. So it's interesting. It and and we don't want to dive into the depth of this. The only, the only reason I put this was this is the first thing that we captured that we were like, whoa, that's strange. After seeing lots of dust particles and stuff that look similar, but the, what stood out about this is when it's in the motion with the camera, you can see the dust and that flying around. It's uh, very easy. But what it did do, make us do is start paying closer attention. And so this was the really, really captured our interest and we started diving in. And so when we took over, this is the, the beginnings of the, 
the what we call the command center. It was a modular home that Bigelow brought in. That was our our control room. So uh, that that was it. That was an old table from a budget suites hotel room that Bob Bigelow owned, and Eric sitting at it. I mean, it literally was. That's as good as it got. Yeah. So then the new owner came in, and and we uh, we built the new control center in the same same place. So this is our scientist Eric, and uh, I don't know who that other guy is, but um, handsome devil. So this is the new control room, and uh, this is where, this is the nerve center of the ranch. And uh, the, the photo credits here, uh, Vice just ran an article, M, uh, MJ Benias came out and did an article, and it came out in Vice, and so shared some of these images, so I want to make sure that he gets credit for them. But, and we're um, excited that, too, when they, I know that we sound like we're just plugging a TV show, but the reason that I do is because it's going to explain everything that we measure and you'll be blown away by the level of what it is that we're trying what has been implemented and created and documented in the search for the truth and you get to see it that's the beauty of it it's no longer you know we've got some cool stuff but we're not going to tell you about it this was the this was the entrance to the ranch when we took over uh old cattle gates and uh the dragon and the new new gates that were put in. So with that, I want to dive in a little bit with our experiences, the things that we have experienced. So to start with Jim here. Jim, coming on, you were really, I remember you, you, weren't, you weren't sure what to think about it. Uh, obviously, a lot of the stories were crazy. What's your feelings about the ranch now, having spent the time out there? What, what's your take of it? Um, I was a skeptic. Uh, as I said, I, I believe that I'm a uh, spiritual person. I had a mother that was Southern Baptist. Uh, both mom and dad ended up um, being converted into the LDS Church, which was great. It was a great medium. But it was things that I didn't fall into. And so I've always been kind of an out-of-the-box type thinker. And the career that I chose was, was uh, uh, being a real estate developer or entrepreneurial risk taker. But going out to the ranch uh, was an eye-opener to me. I, I, I am very curious about life after death. I'd like to think that there's not just what we've got here on Earth or what we see. Uh, and going out to the ranch um, has validated that there is life other than what we've got right here. Um, the spirit side of it, um, I've always had a real interest in the Native Americans um, since I was a young adult. I mean, I've, I've gone through uh, the sweats. I, I've, you know, spent an endless amount of time on the Navajo Nation, where I've gone through the peyote ceremonies with, you know, the president of the Navajo Nation, and some of the experiences I have have been very, very spiritual. Um, and what you'll see, I hopefully, uh, this with these episodes, um, you will see spirit meets what I call a living lab, the science. That to me, I, I have a hard time getting. Uh, perspective on, but the science is, is starting to validate, but the spirit out there is the real deal. It, it, it's, it, you know, I, initially I'd say not for the faint of heart. When you start seeing large red eyes peering through you when, you, when you have your lights on your vehicle get completely blown out, but then as, as the years have moved along and I've witnessed good and bad of physically some of the harm that has been caused out there, and I approach that ranch every time I go on it as if there's a sleeping dog on the porch. I go on there with a level of reverence, I embrace it with a level of love, um, the level of, of, of trying to understand what's going on. Um, and that ranch out there, it's got its mood swings. I mean, I've, I've, I've gone out there with people that, uh, good or bad, have really had some issues thereafter, as if you talk about hitchhikers. I don't know what they brought on the ranch, what they were dealing with personally, but um, it can really move you. Um, so I'm one of those guys that ask people to go on there with a level of just open-mindedness, be humble about it, don't go, in, go into the ranch as if you got a chip on your shoulder or you think you're more than that, because it, it, it will humble you. So, yeah. Brian? So, just to Jim talks, I mean, just following up, it's, it's actually, 
he downplays it a little bit, but when he talked about the lights being blown out on his car, we're not talking about a couple of headlights blowing. And he was driving down the road, and out of nowhere, every single light in his vehicle burst, and it was the actual filament of, of the lights. Every single one of the filaments in every bulb in his vehicle, because Tom was there, he took it to the dealership to say, hey, did we blow a fuse or something like that? And they had to individually replace every, so there was enough of an energy surge as he was driving down the road to completely overload every last filament in all the bulbs in the, in the vehicle of his car. So, you know, he says lights blown out type of a thing, but I just think it's pretty significant. Something that can generate that type of power or energy surge to individually blow out every filament in the bulbs of a car, and you know that they're pretty robust, so. Yeah, the dealer was pretty, uh, when we took it into the dealer, he wanted to know what the heck we'd been doing, where the car had been, because the, the, the odds of that happening, he said, were almost, uh, you know, one in a billion, and so he couldn't believe that every light had simultaneously blown. And, and not a fuse was blown either. There no, none of the fuses were blown, so it was just the light bulbs. So pretty incredible. So, anyway, my experiences, that's a little bit of a tough one. I kind of, for the longest time, kind of carried the mantle of, you know what, nothing happens when I'm on the ranch. Nothing happens when I'm on the ranch. You know, I hear this story, I'll be gone for a weekend and this happens. And as soon as I come back, oh, it's just sagebrush and sky. So, for the longest time, it, you know, I did not believe necessarily, but I hadn't had any personal experiences and I refused to take something that I thought was, you know, just benign or whatever and try and make something out of it because I never wanted to really necessarily insert myself into the narrative unless I knew for a fact that I had experienced something. And it even took later in time when I really experienced a massive thing to realize that I had had an experience. One of the leading up prior to that, um, gosh, I've been working on the property for well over a year, year and a half, and had, like I said, I'd leave, honestly, I'd go for the weekend to go visit my children, and everything would hit the fan. I won't swear again, I've done enough of that already, but stuff would hit the fan, right? And then I'd come back, and it was like, oh, you missed this, this, this. <laughs> like, why does the ranch either hate me or love me? I don't know, but I really hadn't had any experiences. But um, I was out there spending the night with one of our other security guards, and two separate rooms in the house and I was, you know, waiting to go to sleep and was looking at my, you know, watching something on my phone or something like that and I don't know if those of you have, you've been in bed and it feels like something or somebody comes up and knees the side of the bed and shakes it completely, you know. I've got children, they'll come jump on the bed and it's like, you know, it startles you. Well, I was wide awake and I looked around and there was nothing. Something had slammed into the side of the bed and jostled it. And of course, you know, it got my heart rate up a little bit. So I walked in the other room and said to Caleb, I said, uh, have you been up walking around? Or, I mean, this trailer's not the most stable thing, but he's, a, he's just laying there, he's looking at me like, no, I've been here the whole time. And I, so I told him what happened. And I kind of shrugged it off as, you know, whatever. Five minutes later, he comes in, and, he, and Caleb's a big dude. What is he, 6'4", to what, 70? He's 70? a big boy, big boy and a Marine. And he comes in, and his eyes are like Kermit the Frog eyes. They're like this big. He's like, dude, the same thing just happened to me. And that was it. I mean, that was, it, it wasn't anything crazy, but it was just enough to realize it goes back to light, that whole trickster you know, type of mentality. It's just like, hey, Something's here. We're going to let you know about it. So, you know, much like Jim, I, I go out there with good intentions. I don't, I don't want to see the bad side of the ranch. I felt it. I felt times where I've gone to parts on the property and all the hair on my body would stand on end. I don't stick around because, you know, it's a bad feeling. So I get the heck out of there. Um, you know, I had an experience where I was cutting down off of a power pole. I was way up high on a, an extension ladder, about as far as it could go, cutting down an old camera that the Bigelow era had, era had left behind because we were getting a funny reflection off of it that made it, you know, give a bad signal to our cameras. And so I was using a Sawzall, and I, you know, it's a vibrating saw, 
cutting, 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 and so I stopped, and you know, there was no vibration. And then all of a sudden the ladder, the aluminum ladder I was sitting on started to really vibrate really tightly. Um, and I thought, you know, is it on the power line? So I put my hand on the wooden power pole and there was no vibration there. It was just strictly the ladder that was touching the ground was vibrating almost in like response to the vibrations I was causing with the saw. So there's that and then, you know, this past summer I had experiences that fortunately it was during the filming of this, this TV show that, you know, shook me enough that where, you know, I got physically ill and and I think a lot of it was the fact that my mind could not register what I was seeing. And to this day, I will take it to my grave and swear that I know what I experienced or what I saw, and, and you guys will see that too. But, you know, it was a long, long time for me to get the payoff that, that I felt like I wanted from the ranch. Because, you know, you talk about, oh, a bump in the bed or something, but um, it's real. There's real stuff happening. It continually happens. We catch it both on our surveillance and, and with ourselves. And, you know, it's, it's something that has changed my perspective on what reality is um, and what the norm is. Yeah, I think the word random comes up. Um, cannot disclose some of the people that have been invited on that ranch, but some of these people are tough people. I mean, they physically come out, they bench press hundreds of pounds, they had reputations of being pretty tough people. And I remember the particularly one individual coming out, and uh, and, I, and I just didn't want to say anything to him, but he went out there, stood out in the middle of the field, and you could just watch his body language. And uh, this particular gentleman was hospitalized for a couple of weeks afterwards. I go out there with a lot of TLC. I, um, you say it's random. I knock on wood. Fortunately, I have uh, not been physically hurt. But there's people that I cannot disclose names that have been physically hurt by this phenomenon. And um, it, it's, it is an enigma. Um, pray to the good Lord that nobody really gets hurt out there, but there's something out there that, uh, that uh, to me is an unknown. Um, so. What about your experiences, Tom? Well, I, I'm one of those uh, knotheads that went out there with a pretty uh, brazen attitude. Uh, I didn't believe in the paranormal. I do believe in UFOs because a drone would have been a UFO 10 years ago. And so it's easy for my brain to say, oh, just something that we just haven't been told about yet. So I bought into the UFO theory, uh, not little Martians, but just, you know, unidentified flying. And, uh, and as part of my responsibilities, I'm, I'm tasked with taking care of the ranch. So it's my job to make sure it gets irrigated. It's my job to make sure if the fence goes down that it gets fixed, the ditches stay clear, um, the cattle are taken care of and, and staying where they're supposed to be. And when I was brought onto the ranch, I was given specific instructions from the scientists uh, from Bigelow era, don't dig. And I thought, that's absolutely stupid. This is a ranch, that's what we do. We dig ditches, we dig fence posts, we, we dig. And that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And so uh, at one point, uh, security here, there are some places on the ranch that we were having a hard time accessing with the UTVs. And, uh, Sometimes some of our, the incidents that happen require a quick response time and being able to access the ranch. And so, no problem, I'll build you some roads. So, uh, uh, you know, and I didn't believe this don't dig stuff. And uh, I, I did have a pretty brazen attitude. And uh, for, you know, in uh, March of 2017, I came, I experienced a severe head injury. And uh, this head injury came about with no, tr no signs of trauma. Uh, I ended up being hospitalized for a week and during that time, uh, well to this day, uh, it went undiagnosed as far as what caused it. And uh, there's an entire story around it that we'll dive in deeper as the show goes on and, and uh, I look forward in the future to be able to share more of that. And, and it's a story that I feel comfortable sharing because it's backed up by medical records and actual, I, 
I still have a hard time of, of grasping onto things that can't be seen or can't be quantified, can't be measured. Uh, I guess there's still part of me that's skeptic. And so I prefer, uh, I prefer experiences that can be proved. And, uh, and my injury is one of those things that we have hard data for. We have the MRIs, we have the blood tests, we have the, the lab reports. And we have a whole series of events that can be backed up through, through other verifiable methods. And so uh, I look forward to being able to share that, but I, I did suffer it. It almost uh, cost me my life and uh, it humbled me. I, I am much more uh, careful. I go on with, a, like Jim, uh, I, I'm much more careful. Uh, and I think maybe it was that attitude that caused me to experience some of the things I've done, I've, I've, uh, I've heard many voices. Um, I, my time out on the ranch, there was one night where we had a trespasser and I was assisting in, in trying to find this individual. Well, see this thing, we, that when he talks about trying to differentiate between human cause and non-human caused, when something happens, we automatically assume that, it, oh, we got a trespasser that we gotta go take care of. And, and this particular night, there was a basketball that had been thrown against the front of the ranch house. We had caretakers there, and at the time, these, these particular caretakers were elderly and very scared. Somebody or something had been throwing this basketball against the front of their house. This is late, late at night, midnight. Um, so it came out to help with the search. We have all kinds of cameras, uh, the thermographic cameras and that that we are looking for, and, and we couldn't see anybody. I jumped in my vehicle and started across the ranch uh, I had my, I actually had my shotgun, I had my pistol on the seat, my shotgun out the window, and I'm driving with my knees and trying to hold the spotlight, and, and I'm looking for, trying to see a human out there, and I can't see anything, and I get halfway across the ranch, and I hear a very audible, distinct voice that said, stop, turn around. And uh, because I was in the vehicle by myself, uh, the next closest individual was <laughs> a distance away, um, I stopped and I got out and I, I shot my gun off and yelled some obscenities up into the rocks. You know, my shotgun off and yelled some obscenities thinking if a trespasser was up there hiding the rocks, I'd scare them, hopefully. And, uh, and then I got in and I left. And six months later during the winter, I was out there plowing snow with my skid steer. Uh, very loud. It was about 1 a.m. It was snowing lightly. My skid steer's lights were on. It just lit it up like day. And I'd been plowing snow for about two hours at this point. I'd, I'd plowed everything over on the east side and I was, I was starting to move across the road that, that crosses the ranch. And uh, of course the equipment's very loud, the plow was very loud. I had earbuds in listening to a, a, an audible book. And so there's no way I could hear some, somebody talking. You could, have, but you could have been standing outside the machine and yelled and I couldn't have heard it. And I get to that exact same spot that I was at with my vehicle six months earlier and I hear that same voice say, stop, turn around. And I didn't think anything of it. I just, I spun the skid steer around. It takes me four passes to clear the road all the way off. I went back to the ranch house. I turned around to make my third pass. And when I got to that point, me being me, I thought, that's stupid. Like, I'm gonna, this is dumb. I was just scaring myself and I kept going. I got down the road another, it wasn't very far, 100 feet maybe. And I had this feeling of terror come over me that I cannot explain. I started to shake uncontrollably. Um, it, it, it was an internal feeling that I, I, I've never been so scared in my life. It, and it was like it was out of my control. And I spun around and, and I got my skid steer going full blast, which is maybe 10 miles an hour, and uh, <laughs> making my getaway. And uh, anyways, uh, I've, I've heard those voices. We've had quite a few experiences. I don't want to run out of time before we play this clip. That, that is if you guys want to see the I believe Terry came out to the uh, field one day and found the cattle missing. Searched all over the entire property. This is the uh, bull in the trailer story that your gentleman was referring to. These are three prize bulls. Like, and if you've ever been around cattle before, you know one bull by itself is already bad enough. They don't want anything to right. do. You know, they have one thing on their mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you've got three of them, there's a lot of beef tosterone going on around there. So, anyway, go ahead, continue. 
He eventually uh, searches all throughout the property, sees nothing, no sign of the cattle. Um, I guess on a whim, looks into one of the trailers on the property, this really tight, uh, narrow trailer. Opens it's like a storage container, you know, those big metal storage containers, that's literally what it looks like. Opens the door and finds all three bulls almost stacked like sardines together in almost a hypnotic state. And I guess it's, it's near impossible to kind of corral these things to begin with, much less to put them like sandwiches on so the So they don't like confined spaces, they don't like each other, and they don't like to step over things. You guys have seen cattle guards before that are just, you know, basically steel rails in the ground. They don't want to step over that. Well, they had to step up in this trailer if they actually did that, all three of them together, and hang out in a tight, confined place, and coincidentally reach out around and lock the door behind them. That's some talent. I mean, we're talking prized cattle, if that's really the case. But honestly, that's what happened. And then all of a sudden, it was like they were in a catatonic state. They came to, and then all hell broke loose. And they started kicking, and finally, eventually kicked one of the panels out of the side of the trailer. And that's how they were able to get them out. Um, and that's still, you know, the, the door was still locked. And coincidentally, the metal corral around the area stayed magnetized for several hours afterward. It had gone, there had been something, enough of an electromagnetic pulse or something that had put these animals into a catatonic state and in doing so was powerful enough that it magnetized the rails to the corrals for several hours after. Very good. You know what, while we're working on this, let's do some more questions and answers. Yeah, we might as well. We're gonna figure it out, don't worry. We wing it, that's what we do. Uh, I'm also from Utah. Um, interesting, the last six or seven years, I've met people coming out of the woodwork who uh, can see angels, spirit guides, that kind of thing. And, uh, and I've started to open up to some of this. I'm curious um, if you guys have anyone like that that you bring on the ranch, that have spiritual gifts, that can see things, that uh, dealt with shamans or are shamans, that talk about protection, spiritual protection. If they are, like, what do they tell you about who's with you in terms of guardian angels like if you're gone for the weekend is your presence gone with potential guardian angels or anything making a difference or I mean, do you have anyone that's given feedback on those things actually yes we do um I'm, i don't i don't want to name individuals just you know for their own sake uh but but we do have um actually a couple different people that, you know, can sense energy and can see those types of things and have told us that, you know, the ranch actually has almost like a split personality. It's almost like there's a good versus evil battle type going on. It's strange. Um, previous to the experience that I mentioned to you, um, I, my father passed away 21 years ago now and at very young age, and I hated the fact. He was my hero. I loved him. It, it was, you know... I hated the fact that I never, you know, you talk about people, oh, I can feel your dad so close by. I never did. Well, part of the reason that I love Skinwalker Ranch is because every time I'm there, I feel, like, close to my father, as if he could possibly be, you know, if you want to term it that way, I'm not throwing anything out there. My mind is open to whatever that possible guardian angel that I have there. and. There's been multiple experiences where people have talked about, you know, having this feeling of something watching over them for the opposite of something that's out to get them. And a lot of time it depends on the attitude they take and the way that they approach the property itself. But yes, we've, we've had both, you know, Na Native American people that have, have shared some stuff with us as well as um, you know, this individual that has those types of gifts. Well. And, uh, and is that where sort of the idea that there was a curse put on? I guess that's just been historical. Yeah, I mean, passed I, have down, I or seen, did someone intuitive seen... say, oh, there was a curse put here? So it's a historical thing okay. because, you know, 
the Navajos were residents of the area, the Utes came into the area and along with, you know, the government, the army, were complicit in helping drive the Navajos from that area and took over that area. And so with that, as they left, which Skinwalker, if anyone spent any time in the Navajo Nation, this isn't a new thing that's unique to that area. That is something that they take very seriously. It's like, you know, saying the devil or whatever it might be. And so they basically, because we're driven out of their land, said, you know, we're gonna put the curse of this particular bad thing on you because of what you've done to us. It's kind of a last resort for the Navajo too. You know, they had all sorts of means to drive their enemy out of the land, and it's kind of a, their Hail Mary, I guess, to resort to, this, this is not a revered member of their community, this was considered bad medicine, or somebody who practiced a dark art, not someone who was, I guess, revered within the community. So, if, if the battle wasn't going well, and you're going to lose, you might as well raise the earth, and that was a time to bring in the skinwalkers who were these cursed individuals to begin with. They're, they're not benevolent. Benevolent, yeah. How many of you guys are familiar with Travis Taylor? Who was up there? Okay, some of you. I mean, he's a double PhD aerospace. You know, he, he works, he's, he works for the Department of Defense with their space program and everything. I mean, he's got instruments on the space station, everything like that. And honestly, one of the most interesting things that we've seen with association with the ranch is is Travis Taylor. He honestly when we first met him when he was invited to become he's more of an experimental scientist to come and help out with things uh, he said well I'll do it but I think y'all are batshit crazy. He's like there ain't nothing I mean he's got this exact southern, quote by the know, way. He's got he's got this uh, Alabama accent, you know, it's like, y'all are batshit crazy, there ain't nothing out there that we can't explain away, you know, all this different kind of stuff. And, you know, both Tom and I looked at each other and our first thoughts were, where can we bury a body on the ranch? Because we didn't want any part of this guy. And, uh, so... We're running out of places. Yeah. And so, anyway, he came on and it was so interesting to see the transformation of I'm going to prove everything can be explained. I can prove that these are just stories. None of this stuff happens too. By the end of a particular part where he came out with that cavalier attitude that Jim was talking about and whatever the phenomenon is, messed with him the entire time to where finally his words were, that's it. I'm going batshit crazy. And now to this day, he calls and texts me all the time telling me about crazy stuff that's happening to him and that he thinks he's lost his mind because, you know, he was, it was, it was great because he was the biggest skeptic and had the intelligence and the scientific background and all this knowledge that he was going to prove that everything had an explanation. That was 30 minutes of time on the ranch and it already had his mind kind of blown and it just continues on. So you'll have fun watching his transformation as well. I really think we're just scratching the surface. Um, there's, I think the veil is very thin out there, uh, especially, especially with some people where I think they're more, maybe more transparent than others. But um, that ranch to me is, is a phenomenon. Uh, it's something that I go out there very gently, I embrace it with a level of humility. I go in there with a lot of prayer, in and out. But there's things that, that I cannot disclose right now, but uh, hopefully uh, as the episodes start to move forward, we can be a little bit, create a little bit more disclosure to you. But it's the real deal. So I'm excited about uh, sharing some of these opportunities with you. And I can tell you watching the episode, I just had you know, an emotional reaction to it. I. Uh, Obviously, I'm in a pretty emotionally fragile state based on what Tom alluded to happened uh, just last night at my house. But it reinforced the reason why I needed to stay here and support the team and share the story with all of you guys. You know, what you're seeing there is not just some TV show to raise money or to create some sort of entertainment and to hoax things. 
you know, it is the real deal out there. That is the reason why 14 years later I'm still here and I hope to be here another 14 years until this mystery, hopefully before then, is solved. And I'm just, uh, I'm blessed and I'm grateful for all of you guys to hear our stories and, and to participate in this. So uh, we had the observation period and after we determined there was something going on, the discussion turned to, okay, there is something going on. Now how do we go about investigating it? And do we share what we're finding? Different philosophies on that. Obviously, um, you know, I think because Bigelow took government money, that's all classified and he can't share it. Uh, you know, that's just a theory. But uh, we, we had a pretty robust discussion of the pros and cons of do we release what we're seeing or do we keep it quiet? And uh, the one thing that I, that I really admire the owner for is, is uh, said, I, I don't see any benefit to keeping this to ourselves. As long as it's done responsibly, uh, I, I believe that this, belong, this information belongs to the world. And so then the, the discussion turned to how do we go about releasing that. This show is the result of that. And I think the thing that makes this show so special is, is that um, the, the network has been very good to allow us. Uh, it's not scripted. <coughs> And basically, the story is they're going to come along for the ride. If nothing happens, that's a story as well. But uh, fortunately, the, the ranch likes to show off. And, uh, and so uh, what, what you guys are going to see is that, that it's real, it's unscripted, and it's our efforts to start to peel back the curtain and share the secret of Skinwalker Ranch. And we're, we're on that uh, journey ourselves of trying to discover that. And I think it's become personal to each one of us for our own different reasons. And I know it has for me. I, I want to understand what happened and, and if it's affecting other people, you know. So I think with that, uh, we have a few minutes left. I think we take questions. If you guys have any other remarks you want to say? No, I think you bookended it perfectly. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate Tom. it. So go ahead. Thank you all so much for sharing. It's so interesting. Is it known if there are any Native Americans um, buried on that ranch? That is a good question, and we've, we've wondered about it. Um, I think that we inherited the narrative don't dig on the property. You know, you shouldn't dig, that's when bad stuff happens. We don't know exactly where that came from. We don't know. It was kind of, you know, that's what, in, that's what we inherited. So we have often, we've, we've taken that with a level of respect because we don't know if that is the reason, if there's, you know, Native Americans buried there or if there's truly, you know, it goes as outlandish as saying there's an underground base where, you know, spaceships are and things like that. I don't know, but uh, we are very, very respectful My so understanding that we don't is yes. disturb that. Yes. I, uh, Thank you. I think there are. I was lucky at one point to... Uh, come across some of the files from the old uh, Bass team through Bigelow. One of the reports that I found in there talks about a local, a local native who approached the Bass team, turned over some paperwork, gave his credentials. They actually invited him onto the property. Uh, through their friendship, he was uh, a well-known uh, police officer, actually, who is no longer alive, but uh, well-known within the community. And I think it was Officer Yazzie. He uh, shared with the Bass team that some of his ancestors, and this was common knowledge among the tribe, were actually buried on the northeastern edge of the ridge and that they shouldn't go up there and disturb them. He, he also, I believe in the paperwork, said some of the rocks were painted white. But I've always been kind of intrigued by adding that faction of the mystery to everything else that's going on out there and seeing how that does play in. And I think it does. I think it does play a role. You're welcome. It's definitely something that we've discussed, uh, and I'll tell you that before any, before we disturb the earth, minus the fence posts and the ditches, I feel entitled to be able to do that. But uh, any any disturbing the earth beyond what's absolutely necessary for the ranch, I can tell you that great precautions are taken uh, so we can avoid uh, accidentally disturbing something like that. So it, it is something that's in the forefront of our mind. 
In 1945, there were these scrolls discovered in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. These scrolls talked about a, about a group of beings called the Archons who secretly control the world behind the scenes. Apparently, they have the ability to manipulate reality and even change their form. Have you ever heard this before? And if you have, have you considered the possibility that maybe it's these Archons at the Skinwalker Ranch, you know, just trying to lead you astray and keep you from and keeping you from seeing the truth? Yeah, man, you totally nailed it. I mean, that's, that's been my impression of what's going on out there for quite some time. Eric Bard, the chief scientist, always broke it down into three sandboxes. You know, either it's some sort of weather phenomena, it's something spiritual or archon, or it's uh, our own military. And it, it, it's this big uh, shuffling game, depending on what data points we come across, of which one of these boxes fits the narrative of, of what this is. Uh, back to your story of the archons, I, I've always found that, or I call them the, the djinn, which I think is really the same thing, has been a perfect actor that seems to have all the characteristics that we see at play at the ranch. You know, the ability to shape shift. Um, these, these creatures, they were considered, called by the, in the Quran, um, they were created before man, is my understanding, and they were called the smokeless fire. You know, man was created from the earth, the jinn who came before man were created from the smokeless fire. And the most common thing that we see at the ranch, or at least that I've experienced, has been these balls of plasma or a smokeless fire. Um, they were also banished, supposedly. Uh, there's other stories that they got into a, some sort of biblical fight. They, these were the fallen angels. And they were cast down into the earth. And as the story goes, they were cast down and they sought out shelters in the deep, lonely deserts. <laughs> the mountains of the deserts. And we have the perfect ridgeline, atmosphere, reservation, homestead for such a mythological creature who apparently is more than mythology, is what we're seeing. And then I'll just say on, uh, I'm, I have to be the, the skeptic. I'll, well, no, I just, in, uh, in also just covering the ranch, uh, adamantium, um, it's something that's been thought about. Um, our scientists will tell you, Eric will be the first one to, his famous line is, I'm not here to believe, I'm not here to d disbelieve, I'm here to observe. And, and he will, so he really doesn't subscribe to any theory. He simply, Eric's the type, and he's the head scientist, he's the type that will just say, I'm gonna go wherever the data is. And, and he's, you know, he has, he's aware of these different categories, but he is extremely, you'll never find anybody more um, detached than Eric when it comes to trying to subscribe to something. So it, it has been discussed, but um, he, he'll be the first to tell you, I'm not going to believe, I'm not going to disbelieve, I'm just here to see what the data says. So. And I like how you brought up the point of there is something to the ranch that you bring something to the table at the ranch and it has this ability or at least has been my experience that it amplifies what you bring to the ranch. So if you're front loaded with these beliefs, this uh, it could be religious beliefs, it could be the belief in ET, aliens. It seems to amplify that for these special individuals that it almost has a calling for. And they seem to be the ones that have these kind of experiences. I myself, when I first went out there, had the most dramatic experiences that I've ever had. I'm still, to this day, the ranch is as active as ever. However, eventually, and this almost seems impossible, even the novel begins to wear off. And Clearly, the things we were experiencing out there initially and all the stories that I had read, I brought to the table. I was front-loaded. I, I wanted to believe. That didn't, that didn't make me a blind believer. I was still a skeptic at heart. I wanted to make sure that I was actually experiencing the real thing, not just some fantasy in my head. You know, it, it had to be vetted properly. When I would go with friends, I was the skeptic among my friends because I was looking for that rare nugget of gold you know, in a sea of ore. So. And, I'm going to cut you off so we can get to the other questions. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> but I think it's a great question, question very Thank much. You. Thank you. Don't put a quarter in Ryan Skinner. He'll go all night. <laughs> Interesting. I, I just have a simple question. <clears throat> I was curious, each one of you, if you have uh, camped out like solo or hiked to the night in the place solo um, or possibly as a group, uh, where I live, for example, the, there's a certain time and nobody's allowed to be out at night. It's, it's, it, everybody knows it's uh, 
you're not allowed. And I just wondered if you're if you've done solo uh, yourselves. I'll uh, I'll say that I'm I've spent many many nights out there by myself. Uh, I say by myself, I find comfort in, uh, we have a pretty extensive surveillance system, and uh, a lot of times when I'm out there and think I'm by myself, Eric will text me and say, I see you. And so uh, uh, I, I find comfort knowing that uh, Eric is watching behind the scenes. But um, I have spent many nights out there by myself, and I'll tell you that um, there's been a few times, nine out of 10 times, my experience with the ranch, nine out of 10 times I'm there, very pu very peaceful, very serene. Just, I, I love it there during those times. And then there's that one out of 10 that you go and it, uh, it doesn't want you there. And it, it's, pretty, it's pretty forceful in letting you know. And I, one night I was going over to change, out, to change the water in a head gate, 2.30 in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. I had the ranch dogs with me. I was on the UTV going across the ranch. And it got almost over to Homestead 2, which seems to be a really uh, a hot spot for a lot of activity. And the dog stopped. And it just stopped mid-stride and looked and turned around and started headed back for the house. And so I stopped and turned the UTV around and I thought, if something's out here, I'm, I won't be headed back that way. So I got off the UTV park. It was facing back towards the house and I, I caught up with the dog and coaxed him and, and, and I had some treats. I bribed him. Got him turned around, we started walking back towards the head gate. It needed to be changed and get, I think it was pretty close to the exact same spot. And the dog again stopped mid stride. He's a Labrador and the hair raised on the back of his neck, kind of like a little mohawk. He just stopped and he let out a little growl and then turned around and he was on a dead run for the house. And uh, I figured if it, if it wasn't first safe for the dog, it wasn't safe for me. And I got out of there as well. But there's, there's times like that that it, you, you can feel that it's not safe to be there. And, uh, and I've learned not to push my luck. That's my experience. What about you guys? Yeah, I've been out there a ton of times by myself. I mean, that's kind of my job, right? Um, same type of a thing. There's been times when, I mean, the majority of the time, I love it. It's, you can see the stars. I mean, you, if you want to see the Milky Way, <laughs> there's no place like that to see it. And, but there will be times where I'll, even like you said, you'll drive down a section of the road and it's almost like you just drove into a totally different climate where it's 50 degrees colder. And you just get a terrible feeling, hair on your body stands on end, and you just know you need to beat feet out of that area. So I haven't been injured, but I'm also very cautious that when I get those early warning signs, I turn tail and get out of here. One, uh, I'm going to cut you off, actually. Yeah. One last question so we can get to you. Okay. I have two that might be intertwined. Can you hear me? Um, the book mentioned several instances where the cameras don't work. You know, they have them set. And then another thing is James Gilliland of East Eddy Ranch, when he, uh, the History Channel came out to visit them, he said they threw away all the best footage proving that there are no UFOs at his ranch. You have to prove that. So, so do you, have you to seen answer your instances? second question, yeah. the good news is the owner of the property is half producer in this, and I've seen the first four episodes. Nothing's getting thrown out, I good. promise you. All right. And then your first question was just in, according to the book, uh, Remind me, what, what was her first, sorry, what was your first question again? Oh, yeah, no, that, I can tell you, we are beyond frustrated with that. The electronics on the property, they fail constantly. We'll pick something up on one sensor and cameras will go off. Whatever the noise or the vibration is finally goes away and the cameras kick back on. It's... We're dealing with something really smart. That's why I make fun of the bait pens, because if they can do that stuff, I don't think they're going to pick the cow that's there slathered in barbecue sauce in a bait pen. Okay. You mentioned your head injury, but could you give us some details of how that occurred? Um, yeah, I'll just, how much time are we at? Five minutes. Five minutes. 
Um, yeah. Close it out with a head injury story, Tom. Well, I, I'm, I, like I say, I look forward to the day when I can uh, share a story because there's a story there that uh, it turned my world upside down and it changed the way that I view the world we live in. Um, and uh, it, it also forced me to accept and acknowledge that there are things in this world that we can't explain. And uh, that, that, was, that was hard for me. Um, I was very, I am very religious, um, spiritual more now than, uh, but anyways, um, the head injury, the, the short answer is, is that I had fluid that entered into the back of my head that came and separated the fatty tissue of my scalp from my skull. So it basically scalped me and about three days in it was to the point that I could grab my hair and basically walk my face around my head. Um, it was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. I have a pretty high pain tolerance. Uh, never experienced anything like that. And uh, uh, you know, and, and to be honest, at the beginning, I didn't even I refused to accept the fact that it was associated with the ranch. But uh, as time has come or gone on, and, and the investigation on what happened takes place, uh, it becomes harder and harder to say that somehow they're not associated and related. And so. Uh, well, That's the, fact, the short version. And the, Tom's very modest with it, but the fact that the doctors to this day, there's nothing medically in books or anything like that that can pinpoint or cause what happened to Thomas to happen. It's just they're all dumbfounded. They're all flabbergasted, and it's still an unsolved mystery, and we're just glad that we have him because he's invaluable. They, they, ran, <laughs> they ran about four dozen tests over the course of the week. And uh, my doctor was getting very frustrated because he'd come in and uh, not only was I healthy, but he'd come in and say, you're the healthiest sick person I've ever met. Um, I, all, my, all my labs were coming back, not just good, but almost near perfect. And uh, they'd think, oh, maybe it's this, and we'd do the tests and then come back, and it was, it was not that. And uh, so a lot of frustration on the medical staff's part. He was conferring with neurologists uh, from around the, the region, Salt Lake City, and also across the country, a, a couple different people, and, uh, and nobody had seen it before. Um, he was a military doctor and said that he'd seen similar things, but they were all associated with trauma. So there was a, a, you know, a severe hit to the head or a gunshot. There was something that they could show that would produce that type of injury. And uh, with myself, uh, there was none of that. So uh, hopefully, you know, that answers a little bit more. And I, and I look forward to, in the future, being able to share more details and, and, and share more of that as time goes on. But Ladies and gentlemen, the Skinwalker Ranch panel. Thank you. Thank, thanks for letting us come. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen.